Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Frédéric Lavoie. I, I used to sail on the ships uh, for close to uh, over 15 years, uh, which seven of those were as a chief engineer. After an, an, the normal pattern is to go in the office or you stay on the ship. The, the job on the ship is always challenging, but I, I kind of wanted some change. So I became a fleet superintendent, which is your, the operational manager of uh, maybe a fleet of four or five vessels. And then I went to um, a project manager. And my first project was uh, the digitalization of uh, CSL, which is, I'm still stuck with it. They say if, you're, if you start with pi, you never get out. So <laughs> there I am. But uh, anyway, they say also that uh, there's a song saying, uh, what are you going to do with a crazy sailor? And definitely the answer is not put him on stage. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll pass the mic to uh, Rémi. So my name is Rémi Duquet, I'm <laughs> Vice President at Maya, and we've been the Pi Integrator for uh, CSL. Um, in a nutshell, it's the first time that you're going to see a space cadet and an ex-sailor on the same stage, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so our journey today uh, will be to go through a packed agenda, and I'm not going to read through this slide, but essentially, you know, you, you have to think of, of vessels as moving factories. And, and when you think of the intricacies around that, uh, you'll see that we have a lot to share, good lessons learned, and hopefully you'll enjoy uh, the presentation today. Uh, just a one slider on, on who Maya is. So we're the pie integrator for CSL. Uh, we have a deep bench, right? So we have uh, 35 years of software development, pie integration, simulation <coughs> services, and uh, applied AI uh, as a service. So we, we offer quite, quite a bit in terms of the breadth of the knowledge and know-how that we can bring to a customer like CSL. So from both the IT side all the way to the OT side, we have people across, we have 200 people at Maya that can serve at different stages of, of the project, and I think that was key uh, for the CSL project. So this slide is uh, for the deck of slide, because we'll go right to the next one, and uh, we're gonna show a, sh a short movie, and I will talk through our, our operation. So basically, CSL is a ship owner and operator of more or less 60 uh, type of ships, 60 vessels, which is an all bulk carrier. Um, some are <coughs> self unloaders, some are gearless, uh, cement carriers. Uh, cement is quite different than our, our normal trade, it's more like it's endo like a liquid. So this, this is more endo like bulk. Um, uh, our operation is across the world. We have office, our main office is in Montreal. Uh, we, are, we have offices in Australia, Europe, Boston, uh, Indonesia, and some scattered office everywhere also. So this is, a, this is an example. Uh, the ship is doing some transshipment in the Bay of San Francisco. The ship is too heavy, uh, it's too deep to go to, to that port of call. So they stop in the bay a barge comes along the ship, and then they offload some of their cargo, and then they go to the to the port of call with enough underwater with enough water under their keel to uh, to tie up the ship and discharge the remaining uh, the most of the cargo. Uh, this is uh, to control the dust. Often uh, there's uh, houses etc. around uh, the port of call, so we don't want to make too much dust. So the the movie runs for about. Five minutes, we're not going to show the whole five minutes, but it's available to you if you want to look at it. Yeah, you can go to the next slide. So summary of O2. So what was the goal in O2? Uh, CSL is uh, always looking for the perfect shipping day. And, and for us, it's, first it's people, second is environment, and third is property. So we're using the system, uh, we're leveraging the system in that, in that aspect. And then after, uh, we're leveraging the system for better efficiency, uh, performance, cycle performance. Uh, the timeline, we can go to the next slide. <coughs> timeline, uh, we started with one ship in 2017. It was a, a more a test uh, rather than a, a, tr a, a proof of concept. We just wanted to test the, the satellite, the, the movement, everything. We didn't. I mean, the marine business is a bit late in that sense. As he said, we're the first customer signing up in the AI and agreement with the OSI stuff. So CSL is ahead of the game in that sense, but it's late if you compare it to other industries. 
Uh, in 2017, we start with a real pilot project. This is when I joined the game. And uh, in 20, last winter, there was a major shutdown uh, in, in the Great Lakes because of the winter. So that's a cycling thing. It happens every winter. So we installed all the hardware to do on 16 ships. Now the, most people are coding and et cetera. And the, 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 the MVP is May 1st. <coughs> so. so if we look at the key business drivers leading to that uh, CSL's fleet uh, deployment, you see a, a few key elements that you've seen probably in other presentations. You know, if you look at regulations, you look at uh, amount of paperwork, and you know, when you're on a ship, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of not easy to just take notes and make sure they don't get wet and then you know, mail them. There's no like, little birds flying around to go and pick up you know, your, your mail. Um, so from, from all these challenges and the distribution of the fleet, you, you're talking 65 ships that are running around globally and quite intricate as you've seen in the movie uh, in terms of the, you know, the pattern and, and the way that they operate. So we had to kind of balance the fleet management and the operations. Each little factory, moving factory, needs to operate on its own with, you know, uh, all the, the, let's say, the, the visibility of, of the fleet. So what we looked at as a solution is really setting up a digital infrastructure that combines a centrally deployed architecture with local, uh, let's say, very minimal IT infrastructure on, on each of the factory, on each of the ship. So from a, a re result and, and targeted ROI, there were, let's say, areas of improvement, certainly the, the fuel efficiency so if you look at a fleet and, you know, there's a lot of, of ships around, it looks, it's not maybe as, as bad as the airline industry, but when you look at it on the map, you'll see the same patterns of lots of ships going in and out of locks and, and all of this. So just arriving in time, either slowing down or accelerating a little bit, may make a big difference in the gains that you make. Um, so, you know, those, those fuel efficiency was definitely a target. Small or less uh, manual entries clearly was a, a big component of that. And we'll see a little bit later what we've done for this. Less voyage dis disruption. When you go through a very narrow canal, uh, getting a phone call from the office about, you know, something maybe related or unrelated to your voyage uh, is dis disrupting the actual operation. So these things of green light, you know, red light from the office not to call at, at these moments is, is actually an, an important factor uh, to avoid problems. And just a pre-infringement warning, there is no, um, you know, lines on, on the sea or on, on the rivers, right? So if you're in a whale zone, well, there is no line <laughs> to tell you that you're in the zone or you're not in the zone. And these are... On top of that zone is moving all over the place, so... Yeah, exactly. Depending so, where the whales uh, decide to hang out that day, the zone will move for a couple yeah. of weeks. Yeah, they, they tend to move around these whales. <laughs> um, so for all these, these good reasons, uh, you know, pre-infringement warning became an, an important factor and the data-driven maintenance as a secondary for the factory moving, there's lots of stuff, engines and stuff running on, on those ships. So Fred, I'll let you cover here. There's a, I'm gonna talk about the self unloader, but there's a short video that shows more or less how it works. It's about two minutes. The self-unloading ship comprises a series of holds that are separated by bulkheads. The holds typically have two series of openings aligned on the port and starboard sides of the ship. The ship's holds use gravity feet to discharge the load through their base. The flow from each of the openings is controlled by actuation of a gate. Each of the gates is independently controlled with hydraulic actuators or cylinders. Material is simply pulled from below the hopper opening at a controlled rate. For larger lump material or poor flowing cargoes, the operator simply increases the gate opening to allow larger lumps to pass or prevent stable arches from forming over the opening. The discharge <coughs> rate is controlled by adjusting the belt speed. This is particularly attractive for applications demanding varied discharge rates with poor flowing cargoes. The operator can stop and restart the belt with the gate open. Material flowing onto the tunnel conveyors makes its way to the stern of the vessel. A smaller pair of transfer conveyors directs the flow to the center of the ship. One of the most important and innovative parts of the self-unloading system 
is the C-loop elevator. The C-loop elevator consists of inner and outer belt loops. The speed of the belts is synchronized so material entering at the bottom is sandwiched between them and carried to the deck level. The belt separation is exaggerated here for clarity. The material leaves the C-loop elevator and drops onto the boom conveyor. The boom conveyor is typically capable of luffing through an angle of 18 degrees. The boom typically slews through an angle of 90 degrees to both port and starboard sides of the vessel. The mooring structure for self-unloaders tends to be quite simple and light in comparison to that required for mobile grab cranes or continuous ship unloaders. The discharge conveyor is typically covered. This reduces both dust and the trail of spill that's common with grab-based discharge systems. So, so we don't we don't need to. Uh, I guess you guys all know that from just that small operation, there's quite a bit of data that are provided or aggregated. So for for this, we, we have uh, developed a self, uh, unloading report, which is auto automatically uh, created with PyData Link. So the, we have connected to the PLC, and uh, basically that. The, by knowing where the ship is and where it's supposed to go, so when the ship arrives to its port of call at zero speed, we can say, okay, the ship has arrived. So first time stamp, ship has arrived. Then uh, as the unloading rate uh, goes above 200 ton per hour, because we never go under 200 and sometimes there's like, bad data, so we put a, some kind of a filter. When the unloading rate goes above 200 ton per hour, then we start unloading. When it goes below, we stop. And below for a certain amount of time, because let's say the guy doesn't pay attention to the gates, the operator, then, then it goes below for one minute. We don't want that all that time stamp. So we aggregate that data in basically on the on the <coughs> on the vertical in 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 events. So when the ship arrives, is on is preparing to unload. When you start unloading is the green vertical one. The second one is delay, and the third one is the preparation for departure. So as you look at the system live, uh, when the ship, for example, is not unloading, it will show not unloading because we cannot know automatically what's, why it's not unloading with, with certainty. So it needs the next event to qualify the previous event. So when the if the ship starts unloading again, then it was a delay. And this is where we ask the crew to the only manual input is it will come in the delay. Is it ship cause because they had a, a broken piece of equipment or is it uh, because the port need to go for a break? So then they comment, they say why. Uh, from this, we, uh, <coughs> if you see on the horizontal bar, it's this space uh, during the time. So that bar is always the same side, same length, I mean. And uh, we, preparation, unloading, the delays, where they happen during the unload and preparation for departure. So again, a second example, if the second event after the ship has stopped unloading is the ship is moving, then it's departure preparation. Uh, from this, we gather a lot of KPIs. So we're doing some unloading rate, so a uh, gross rate, which is from start to finish, including the delays, a net rate, which is excluding the delays, and a port stay rate. Uh, <clears throat> if you keep going down, uh, from, uh, also, this we're, we're from, from the rate we are using other sensors that are within the engine room, measuring the fuel and the, the, the power to, uh, to qualify how much power and fuel we have used to do these operations. So next slide is uh, second page. So this is what, what I was just talking about. So we have defined it in the fuel consumption f per event and per user. So uh, basically during an unload, you get the house load, which is air conditioning, light, etc. The, the things that are always on on the ship. 
Uh, you have the hydraulics that operates the unloading gear. You have the motor drives. And, uh, <coughs> and then after, you, have, you also have it by a kilowatt. So basically, you know, the engineer likes to know how many kilowatts. The guy, the accountant, accountant likes to know how much fuel you burn. So we have the, the two versions of the same story. Uh, uh, if you go auxiliary engine at the, uh, at the middle there, there's a, the, the, the power management usage. So some people like to have three, like there's different safety margin. So some people are comfortable more or less. Therefore, uh, we're checking how many tons per generator uh, running. Uh, all these belts are driven by, on, on the most modern ship, those belts are driven by a vari variable frequency drive. And our mojo is the slower, the better for a given rate. So because for usage, for energy consumption, uh, so we're measuring how much every belt has, uh, has, has uh, traveled. <clears throat> and at the end, it's uh, for maintenance purposes. The bottom, so we're taking, after the system has revved up to a, uh, its, its speed, we're time stamping the kilowatt per motor at the given speed. And then uh, we're doing the same for the last stop. And then we can compare from cold, from a cold system to warm system, and from a system to another. Therefore, like, uh, a very poorly maintained uh, self-unloading conveyor will draw a lot more energy at no load. Uh, from there, we, you know, we're gonna go where Simex is definitely eventually, but that's, that's where we are now. Uh, we're taking the peak, the average for the unloads, so we can find out where the best operators are, where the, to find the perfect unload, and then drive some intelligence from that. Uh, and then we are taking uh, <coughs> the temperature, average and peak, also per motor, so we can do preventive maintenance. Uh, at the bottom, we compare one motor to another, so as you've seen in the movie, uh, the boom and the loop has two motors on a, on a gearbox each attached to the same pulley. So they have to give the same amount of work. So th this is the two first one, which is very close in margin, 0.1% difference. And the two last one is two different belt with two different conveyor, uh, the tunnel belt, the whole length of the ship, and the, the transfer belt that brings the cargo to the center are, are independent with their own motor and gearbox. Uh, this partially unload was is a, at a port of call where the the ship the the dock is so high that we need to list the ship a little bit. If you if you imagine the boom, we need to list the ship a little bit like this in order to clear, and then we start unloading. Then the ship comes up. Then we can correct that. But the gravity flow brings most of the cargo to one side of the ship, and you can see here it's almost eight or nine percent. So we know the system worked good. Uh, so <coughs> that, that's it for that slide. So let me uh, kind of talk a little bit on the uh, distributed architecture that was put in place to provide all that, that data. So again, the challenges are two ways. One is you have the, the crew on board that need to operate with that data in real time, and then you have the, the, the crew at the center uh, in, in, at the headquarter that need to manage you know, all the fleet data so that you, they can optimize the fleet. So those often can come you know, at odds with each other, right? So we, we had to kind of make decisions on, on that uh, infrastructure. So moving factories and com combining remote operations and centrally uh, managed KPIs. So the solution essentially in the end, there's a, a central fleet management support center that's, uh, that's set up where the central Pi server is located and where all the main components of the Pi system, as, as you can see here, uh, were installed and, and integrated. And then on each ship, we've distributed a, literally a, a black box uh, in onto each of the ship. And there's no you know, big IT department on each ship, right? So it's a, it's a black box that you connect two wires in and you, know, you, you click on and, and everything is, is live. Um, so that's, that was essentially the decision to make easier and cheaper the deployments uh, on these 65 sheep in, uh, ships in, in the vessels and the fleet. And it's easier to maintain over time. And given the telecom, uh, let's say, improvement over the years, it's become you know, more and more dependable uh, over the years. And we're hoping it will continue to do so uh, moving forward. 
So today, the, uh, the central uh, server in the fleet management is ready to support. There's 16 ships that are in operations mode, meaning that the data is being collected, and there's a, a go-live that's coming up with, with those ships. Um, one of the reason, and we see here the, the fundamentally different uh, pressure or drivers. On one side, you have the day-to-day -day operations, and on the other side, you have the fleet support center. So on the day-to-day, -day, um, let's say, operations, you have people that you need to give like little uh, warning signals and, and oops moment and say, okay, you know, here's you know, a, a little warning that something may be, uh, let's say, different than your normal operation. So this is you know, a little warning that will uh, guide uh, the people. It's more gui providing guidance at this stage than enforcing you know, a, a some, somebody to do something. Actually, uh, the, goal, the goal is always to provide the guidance. We want to bring the crew. In order to bring the crew, we, it's always going to be an advisory uh, system, maybe until we have automated ships or things like that. But. Right. And the, the crew element is, is a key factor here. So you know, to make sure that it's easy for them and make their life easy, right? The first thing that they asked uh, uh, in the workshop is make our life easy, get us to you know, have less paperwork to manually enter. So that was clearly a, a key element for them. And then on the fleet uh, center, so now that we have all that data centrally collected, and now we can go to you know, doing advanced analytics on that data, uh, making sure early failures are detected, and again, those warning signals sent to the crew to you know, make uh, changes over time. Uh, look at a maintenance plan optimization. So if you have not run a, uh, a belt for a long time, well, why are you doing all this? And if it ran a different range of, of operations, of course, it will change the maintenance. Uh, so that, those are all the elements that, that are being looked at now. And advanced troubleshooting in terms of you know, more complex, intricate uh, details that you may, might not have been able to see before because you didn't have that rich set of, of data. So, uh, so how does O2 work? Well, I'll start. I think you guys all know we, we were connected to uh, the, the SCADA system. On, on the ship, it's, we don't call it SCADA. They have their own little lingo for that. So there's mainly three on our ships, three main SCADA system. One is the bridge EGDIS. It's an electronic chart display uh, integrated system. So all the sensors that the captain needs to maneuver his ship, which is how much water under the keel, the speed of the ship, the wind, uh, the heading and things like that are gathered on a chart and then you can make decisions regarding according to that chart. So we're connected to that. So we're recording all the data every 10 seconds. Uh, the other system is the main en uh, the engine room alarm system. It's an uh, integrated alarm monitoring system. Uh, so there's on a newer ship, there's maybe two or three, two or 3,000 sensors that are connected to that PLC. It's a series of PLCs. And um, it, it also managed the power. So if, if the power goes, there's more power demand on the ship, the generator will start automatically, et cetera. So we're, kind of, we, we're gathering the data from all these sensors. And, and the third one would be the self-unloading PLC, where we're gathering the data from the, the PLC that managed the self-unloading. Uh, <clears throat> so and the, the, basically, the flow meters on our ship we're not the best. So we, we have not had many sensors, but we had the most important one. So we had a, there was a fairly big investment in, in fuel flow meters, because this is where we're going to get most of our return eventually. Uh, an investment in ammeters uh, on, on the important components for us. Important doesn't mean you know expensive sometimes. It could be a small one, but that's very important. It will stop the ship. And uh, basically, that's and then the cabling from all these, these, sen these sensor nodes, I call them, to the black box. From the black box, it goes to the VSAT, goes to the Pi server ashore, and then via internet goes back to the ship. Uh, but the beauty of this is we can make all these systems talk, which used to be completely separated on the ship, talk to each other, and we can get any other system outside uh, talk to that one. So we have, for example, our Voyage management system is IMOS. Or we're, we're integrated with IMOS. Uh, we can integrate with the weather. Uh, geofencing. So we're using uh, uh, RGRS S3 uh, for geofencing. Uh, all the compliance, so the second one is compliance. I say 90% of the compliance on the ship is based on the location of the ship. 
So the ship has a, has a state flag on the back. So for example, an American ship needs to abide by the American ship flag. It also needs to abide by IMO. It also needs to abide by wherever the ship is. So you can, if American flagship is in Canada, you can get Canada authority to go on the ship and start doing inspections. So for the people on board with the environment being so important for us, humanity, um, it's becoming confusing because there's so many rules and depending where you are and et cetera. So we can have people that are basically studying those rules, put them on a layer on the RJ or on S3, and if the ship is in that layer, show those rules to the crew. And if the equipment, whichever one, is not supposed to run in that place, you can give a warning, another warning to the crew. So uh, these are a little bit of the algorithm, but I'll let Remy talk a bit more about uh, the more complicated stuff. So it's a little bit more complicated, but it's not rocket science, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> As I'm a rocket scientist. Uh, so the algorithms and the machine learning then, you know, once you have the right data, right, maybe not just quantity of data, right, to have the right data that's being fed, and you have these experts that know all those complicated and convoluted rules, then you can focus, you know, once you have a good business case and you have the right data, then you can focus on, on the algorithms and the machine learning. Typically, this is not rocket science. I mean, it can be complex, it can be extremely complex, but it's not rocket science. We can implement it and on, on top. And at CSL, we have some people even here in the room uh, that are focusing their efforts on advanced analytics, and, and they're really taking it to the next stage with, with this uh, infrastructure in place now. So change management. So I, I, when I was giving the proof of concept, I, as an engineer, I was focusing on where the money is, the fuel, the maintenance, mainly. And I was not focusing that much on the, what I knew was already sold to the crew. You know, I, I spent most of my time on my career on the ship, so I knew, for example, a couple of things would be quick, uh, real big wins, so I didn't even talk about them. And what we found with the proof of concept is that the people didn't, they didn't care too much because they're, they're busy. I mean, it's, it's very competitive out there. It's not like it used to be, you, know, you spend nine months, you spend two weeks in the port and visiting. Now you're just two months, work, 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 and then you're two months off. So somebody came in, in, in the program, basically my new boss, and he said, no, no, we need to focus on, on what's gonna win. We need to focus on what the crew will like, will be very, what's gonna be very useful to the crew. And from there, once, from there we're gonna get the buy-in, and then after we're gonna push the, the, the important stuff. So I'll, I'll leave Remy talk about the solution on that then. Yeah, so here, you know, the, the request really is, you know, when you go from a manual system, you skip the, the phone with the buttons, and you go straight to a smartphone. <laughs> There's always change that are required uh, along the way. Um, so one of the thing is, you know, if, even if you look at an operational uh, PyVision dashboard, you have a lot of rich set of information. When you look at a captain's, you know, little ship, it's, it's actually very targeted numbers and things that need to appear. So because of that key requirement and the change management of, of the crew on board to get them on board to use, because we, we need them to on board and to, you know, use the system, so we provide an HTML5 uh, web, web uh, environment that really speaks their language without any of the bells and whistles that we can offer from an operational standpoint, which is the, the central fleet management center is definitely using PyVision with all the bells and whistles. But for the fleet on board, it's a very simple, friendly uh, environment where it's an HTML web page uh, you know, with all the fancy, nice new tools, but very simple to use. So. And we'll be linked to uh, PyVision too. So if, if they want to dig further, then they can click to the HTML page and poof, then you can have the dashboards. So for the person that don't care where it's coming from or just likes to see the red or the green, then that's all he looks. The person that cares, then he's going to click and he's going to see all the power of PyVision. So here we're going to show a, a mock-up essentially and I'll let Fred describe the mock-up. Uh, that's been uh, transferred in, in HTML5 uh, for the crew. So uh, I'll start with the, more, the, the noon report because it shows, uh, it illustrates very well what Rimi was saying that the data is locked. Once 
So the noon report is a very traditional thing in shipping. It's been there for a long time, and it comes from Telex age. So it was, it's not at noon, it's at about six in the morning. So the person on the ship, they send the position, they estimate time of arrival, fuel quantity, all that information that you see there. And once it's sent to the office, then it's locked for 24 hours. Uh, in our day and age, 24 hours is a very, very long time. Uh, so the ship get constantly calls from everybody in our, in our contractors, marketing, customers, uh, engineers, uh, everybody. So uh, we basically, their goal is to automate that. So we're doing some intelligence on where the ship is, where the ship is going, so we can know at what time it would be there. But also to have this uh, to be able to override by the crew, because uh, eventually this is going to become official data, and it needs to be validated. So all that data will be automated, but the crew will push it. So we'll say yes, bang. Uh, you know, they, they email on the ship, there, there's so many emails, they don't care. So the pinification and all this, it's, it's not working, it get lost. So we need to have, to enter, to, uh, to, to make it more user friendly. <clears throat> so that's what we did. Uh, the, for example, if you see the quantity of fuel, this is a part of the noon report. So on the more, more modern ship, this will be automatically fed to that box, but on the older ship where we, we're not tied into that PLC because it doesn't exist, well, it's going to be manual input. And then it's still going to push. So the process will be the same for old or new. So that's why we add that requirement also because in order to win, we have to have the same process on all the ship. We cannot say, oh, you guys have pie. You guys don't, so you do it the old way and you guys do it the new way. Uh, another one is uh, I like to talk about is the OWS. So you see the OWS is yellow at the moment. So OWS is a filter that, so all the engine room on, within the ship, all the engine room waters that is in the ship, because there's always a little bit of waters in the engine room that we have to get rid of, uh, has to pass through a filter and has to be analyzed before it can go ashore, uh, it can go in the, uh, in the ocean, uh, because we don't want to pump water, uh, oil in the water. This is, a v this is very strict uh, from all the flags in the world. <coughs> So now we know where the ship is, we know the regulation, so we know if he's allowed, the system Pi knows if he's allowed to use his machine or not. We know where the ship is going, we know the status of the machine, it's on at the moment, and we know that in, at 1.15 or 1.14, the, the other ones will be off, so you better get ready, because it's within an hour, that it turns yellow within an hour. Uh, for example, if we lose connectivity, with VSAT, because it happens, then everything becomes gray. Because you say, don't rely on that data, it's not good. Uh, <clears throat> so that would be the tips. So the oops, I forgot, that would turn red. Uh, because he's, uh, we give a little bit of margin, so it's not going to turn red when he's in the zone. It's going to turn red maybe half hour before he's in the, he's in the zone. Uh, bridge condition. So like Rimi was saying a little bit a, a little while ago, uh, about eight or nine years ago, there was a very, very bad accident, a train accident in Spain. And one of the root cause analysis was that the guy was on the phone when he was supposed, with the office, not with his wife, with the office, answering questions from the office. When, he, when it was an important turn ahead, he was supposed to reduce the speed of the train. He didn't reduce because he was on the phone. It was a major accident. So from, from that, CSL said, we're going to do a bridge condition because there's highly maneuvering areas on the Great Lakes where we're not going to disturb the, the captain. So basically, by knowing where the ship is, uh, we can tell if, it's, uh, if he's in red condition. So if it's red, uh, that's a CSL web page, intranet. Everybody sees the condition of the ship. Don't call the ship. So I don't care. You can call the chief engineer, but don't call the captain. He's on bridge. He doesn't want to hear the phone. We've been trying to implement that for eight years, and the people still call the ship. So there's tools where you can, but, and then the, the, all the people on board the ship, well, and then they call with one phone, and that, the Visa phone don't work. They call with the cell phone, then they try with the other phone, then they send a text. So now that's, good, that's going to be streamlined, and it's going to be very uh, something rigid. So this one is another example of what we're doing. On the self-unloading system, there's lots of safeties. I'm going to give a very clear example, simple example, is pull cords along the conveyor belt. 
So if you walk along the conveyor belt, the conveyor belt is running, and then your arm gets caught for some reason, you just pull the pull cord and it stops. So our system, like our, our operation system, is dictate that all these safeties are, are to be tested within a period of three months, all of them. So me, when I was a chief engineer, what I used to do, actually I used to do them every month, would sit down with the radio in the control room, the electrician would go and we'd do them all and we'd check on the checklist. So we wanted to monitor this, but we didn't want to monitor. We wanted to give a tool, because the, the goal is not to monitor, it's to, to bring a system together. So basically, within the operation, when the, those safeties are activated, whether it's voluntary or not, there's a timestamp in PyData Link or in a dashboard, two places. And if they haven't been activated for two months, then they turn yellow. So the chief engineer, all he has to do is see the yellow one, you know he has one month to test them. So he can tell the, his employee, the tunnel man says, okay, when you walk today towards your control or your workshop, please pull on the third pull cord. So the guy walks, pulls on the pull cord, goes in the workshop, does his stuff, comes back, reset the pull cord, that's it, job's done. No, nothing. You don't have to come with your list, make sure you write. Oh, I didn't write the right one, uh, et cetera. And then also as a chief engineer, you come on in a ship you don't know. You see this, me as, I would, I would ask the guys to go, okay, go test, because I don't know what happened before, I didn't know the guy. So I need to know, make sure that's, that's working fine. Well, you see this, you know it's working fine. So uh, this last one is uh, basically we're looking at aging rather than just pure running hour. So we're benchmarking uh, running hours regard, uh, according to their load of, on the machine. So this is an example of a boom motor. So you see 20 at 20% at is 10 running hours, 60%, 25, etc. This is a 280 uh, kilowatt motor, and there's two. So that's why a green and a blue. There's two motor on the boom. Uh, we can see that they always operate within 60 to 100. The reason we need to have such a big motor is, for example, the, the 260 is that, that port where I said the ship could barely clear. The boom is already all the way up, so the incline is a lot big, bigger than if you keep it like this. <clears throat> so this will drive new ship building because me, yeah, I'm coming and I say, guys, we need to have an easy way to clutch in and clutch out these, these motors. Come on, I mean, you can do one month one, one month two, when you need to have both, you put both on. So that's coming in the future on, on our new, next, uh, next new builds. So that, <clears throat> that we, we, we're doing this for various equipment, not just these motors. So, so lesson learned? Yeah, so key lessons learned, uh, you know, as we got into the, uh, um, let's say, minimum viable solution or product, as you call it uh, in, in, in our lingo. Um, as in any other project, you look at the change management and we focus, we changed focus actually on the change management to make sure that the, the crew would onboard and use the, the, the software in place and, and the system in place and they would see the value for themselves. Embrace right? it. Yeah, embrace it, absolutely. Then there's a technological change, right? So if you look at uh, the, uh, let's say, overall infrastructure that's needed to deploy such, uh, you know, a central server and locally distributed IT network uh, on these moving factories, that's another aspect of the solution. Um, so we've we've really looked at uh, over the last year and a half uh, with CSL. That was a, a very agile approach, right? So we we did a little bit fail fail early, right? Understand the, where the all the the, the showstoppers are before you go and, and deploy to the 65 ships. So the first uh, segment is 16 ships, as we've shown uh, earlier, as a you know first big deployment, 16 ships, and then it goes on worldwide with the, the other uh, areas. It goes on as per dry dock schedule, because every ship needs to have a shutdown every five years as to go to a dry dock. So this is the opportunity we have to basically install the flow meters. So we're, that, that's when we, that's the schedule we choose. So in Canada, it's easy because there's snow and, and ice, so then they stop in port and <laughs> change In, the, the, in the winter, that's it. Yeah. Um, I'll let you talk quickly on, on the uh, today, and then I'll switch into maybe the near future where we're going with, with this. So I think you guys seen where, where we were going with this. So it's really a streamlining or have a holistic way of exchanging information. 
because it's, it's very challenging because you have all these people that want the same information, but they have different views on that information. So they ask the question five times to the crew. So the crew really don't like that, like not at all. And then they have their own interpretation of it. So the data to me is really dumb. It's, that's it, it's there and you, you can't interpret. Uh, so we're streamlining this. Are we streamlining the way we communicate? Uh, <clears throat> So, it, which will give us, like, it's written there, 360 views 24-7 of all the vessel live. Now we have one, uh, one report per day that's going to be live. We have all the ships on the S3 map. You click on the map, yeah, you, it goes to PyVision, and it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, easy, uh, the IT and OT integration, that, that's, for me, is very challenging, but, I mean, I think, we're, we're using that opportunity to bring our IT to the next level on our ships because, I mean, you, you've seen it in the last years, they've been major attack for people like Maersk and it was, it's major cost. So, uh, like I said, the ships are behind in that. So now we're catching up. Well, we have caught up, basically. So uh, I'll let Remy go, keep going. So in the future, near-term future, we look, of course, at leveraging that data in better ways. So with the uh, advanced analytics group at CSL and with the Maya Firepower, we're going to you know, move this and get the most value out of the system as the next step. And of course, there's applied industrial AI, machine learning, deep learning. We're very lucky in Montreal. We're in the center or the epi epicenter of, of, of that growth. Um, so we, we have lots of resources available to, to tackle that. Um, maybe just as uh, simple examples of where the future might lie in terms of visualization. Uh, we've done at Maya some interesting things. So Space Cadet, I was not joking, so this is the Mars rover. <laughs> we've done the, uh, the thermal radiation heat transfer analysis and then every eight hours we got flat files from NASA to look at the real-time telemetry and replay it to make sure that the, the digital twin and the real-time data actually match to find, you know, to improve over time the, the simulation uh, in real time. So this, this was done. We're doing it now in smart buildings uh, at, at Maya, and uh, we've done it always in data center. Last year there was eBay and other presentations here at PyWorld. Um, and now we can look at ships, right? So we've uh, done some of these uh, interesting uh, analysis uh, of, of within the ships. Um, so you'll see it moving a little bit, a little video. But we can go at scale on, on the web HTML5 interface where it's, it's really snappy and, and easy to use and friendly. It doesn't lag like a, you know, uh, the original, let's say, 3D model. Now we, we can do very, uh, very nice uh, visuals. And that will help the, you know, em the team embrace, the crew embrace those, those solutions because they will actually visually see where the, the, the problems are, have started and propagated to. Often you get the warning on a system, but uh, the problem started elsewhere. Right, so that, that we're visual beasts. I mean, let's face it, we, we love things that we can see, smell, touch, you know, view in, in 3D. So this is where the value of, of that, that 3D interface uh, lies. And that's what we're kind of slowly uh, trending towards. So I, wa I wanted to conclude with that picture. I, I was on board uh, the Bay Saint Paul. It's in the Montreal area. She's going to a, a lock and uh, she's passing under her old bridge and going to uh, under a new bridge. The bridge will be uh, in function in June, I think. Uh, so I thought it was pretty good to, uh, so basically we're going into a new era and f the O2, uh, I was thinking it was make a good analogy, it's bridging the gap between the shore and the ship and making one holistic uh, team uh, to move cargo around. So with this, I thank you very much uh, for you to listen. Questions for the sailor, especially. <laughs> <laughs> what time the bar close? <laughs> no, it is a question for the sailor. I was a former sailor, so I'm kind of familiar with the problems with getting internet in the middle of the Atlantic. Yeah. How do you get 24-7 uh, NOC support for your Pi system? Uh, VSAT has grown pretty big uh, since the last 10 years, I would say. So we're using VSAT, and that, that, that's another reason for the, the HTML. So we're sending the data 
uh, on the ship, uh, sorry, ashore. Uh, over there, all the intelligence is happening. And then we're just sending bits, you know, the results of all that intelligence uh, to that HTML page. Very uh, lightweight. Yeah, very right, lightweight, right. and but the, sh the crew has access to their PyVision on their normal, on their IT network. Uh, we've been doing this in Canada. Fortunately, Canada, there's LTE, there's uh, VSAT. Uh, in Australia, our fleet is mainly LTE because they're doing a lot of transshipment, so that means they bring the, the cargo from, from the port to a bigger ship that cannot make it to that port. So it's a, a short run. They, they do it three or four times, and that big ship leaves. But VSAT is very re reliable, uh, has changed, it has evolved a lot. Thank you. So um, I've been thinking about this. I don't know the answer, and maybe some of our audience would like to know as well. So clearly, I mean, I, I know that CSL is a leader in auto unloaders. But I'm not sure I understand the big difference between the benefits of an auto unloader versus a regular bulk. Okay, uh, self-unloader basically can go anywhere where there's water and discharge cargo. I, I, I don't know if you've seen on the movie. So we can go, let's say you have a, you, you need stones, you know, but you don't have infrastructure, but you have a land by the water, there's water. You put tree dolphin there, ship ties up, puts the cargo on your land, and then leaves. Uh, it, it can be basically <laughs> Uh, link totally linked with the unloading system or the, the conveyor system of the shore. So you bring the conveyor uh, over their upper, and then it, the cargo becomes part of their of their conveyor systems right away. And speed uh, and flexibility. So those ships can unload between 200 metric ton per hour to 6,000 metric ton per hour. So you can. Uh, we have unload ships of 30,000 ton of salt under five hours. So the sh ship was there and gone in five hours. So it's quite a big, because uh, it's very, it's expensive, so it's good for everybody. That's it. Any final questions? Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Sir. Sure.